Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the assembly work session. Um, what's today's date? 15? Yeah, April 15th. It's income tax day. What do you mean, what day is it? This, is a, no, this is a work session. And it's what a, do you mean it's not this year? It's a formal meeting day. What? Tax day is Monday. Okay, anyway, folks, I'm going to make some comments, but then I need to go and make some comments at the Kids Day event downtown on behalf of the assembly. All right, I'd like to welcome everybody here at this assembly work session, and I really appreciate Mr. Croft's enthusiasm and taking the lead in scheduling this meeting with the newly elected and sitting assembly members to discuss assembly committee's assignments and procedures. Although I agreed to have this meeting scheduled, I believe it was premature to meet prior to the election of the chair and the vice chair. The municipal code states that the assembly shall meet and organize no later than the third following, the third Tuesday following each regular election. For many years, that has taken place at the second meeting after the election, at the same time the election is certified and the new members are sworn in. Within a week, the clerk's office provides substantial training, which includes presentations from the Office of Management and Budget, the Municipal Attorney, and several other departments. This would have been a more appropriate time to discuss the Senate Committee and procedures with leadership provided by the newly elected Chair and Vice Chair. For those of you aspiring to serve as Chair, I applaud you. It is an honorable and prestigious position, but it is also accepting a tremendous responsibility that you will have all while doing the work you are already doing on behalf of your constituents. The role of chair is not ceremonial. It is a leadership position and is not for the headstrong, but instead a position for someone who has leadership skills, engaged in assembly activities, and one who is constantly reminded of the oath we have all taken to faithfully perform the duties of the Anchorage Assembly to the best of my ability. Performing these duties takes dedication, commitment, and the ability to put citizens first. When you hold the position of assembly and also as chair, the workload increases immensely. The chair is responsible for chairing all work sessions, chairing the regular and special assembly meetings, chairing executive sessions, setting the agenda, addressing personnel issues, signing all assembly documents after approval, chairing the bi-weekly leadership meeting with the administration to review the upcoming meeting agenda and addressing other issues, providing guidance to assembly attorney, municipal clerk, and ombudsman, representing the assembly at many community events, providing guidance and leadership to your colleagues, and more. During my tenure as chair, working with Mr. Traney as vice chair, we established the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee has been very effective in assisting us with our public business. It is the only committee that allows public hearing at that level. It has also proven to be very effective in working through legislation prior to introduction and even after legislation has been introduced. We also made three committees, committees as a whole, Homelessness, Budget Finance, and the Rules Committee. Homelessness is one of the biggest issues that affects each of our districts. The municipality's budget and finances is one of the most important issues that we deal with as a body, and any new or amended legislation presents itself before the entire body for a vote. My recommendation is that you maintain the Rules Committee and keep it along with the Homelessness and Budget and Finance Committee, Committees of the Whole. It has been an honor to serve as Chair of the Anchorage Assembly, and I wish all of you success as you begin or continue your journey as a public servant. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I've got to go, and, you know, as Chair and represent all of you at the Kids' Day and say a few words. But um, have a great day, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Mr. Caney, you have a job. Take care, ma'am. Take care. <laughs> Shameless self-promotion. So what do you want to do, Eric? You called me. Yeah, this isn't about um, uh, who's going to be chair and vice chair. We'll make that decision on Tuesday. Um, uh, the reason that I ask you to appreciate you guys coming is because of the Open Meetings Act, which um, I very much like. It's one of the, the neat changes, uh, Fred, that, that you, you'd already been here, but coming here, the legislature just kind of ignores the Open Meetings Act, wrote itself out, ignored it, and then wrote itself out. Uh, but but it's taken seriously here, and, and I think that's a good thing. It just means, though, it's very hard to have the kind of conversations about what do we want things to look like over the next two years. So the, we'll make the chair, vice chair decisions uh, Tuesday, um, but it, uh, this was the only method that I could see in the act for us to just talk about this. You, you, you have to do it in an open meeting, that's a good thing, but, um, but there isn't really a structure after we do that, then the, the chair and vice chair implement, they can 
listen, they might call a retreat or another meeting like this, but we're, we're heading into a two year, all of us are up for either two or three years, aren't gonna be up for a real election. So we're gonna be here together for uh, two years. And how we wanna structure that, how we want to think about what we do, what goals we have, um, and that, so that flows down to all the, what, what, what do we want committees to look like? How do we want to interact? And bef before all those things, I just thought it would be important to have a, um, a discussion. And this is the way through. Um, I, did, uh, I did print up an agenda, but it really, I meant this to just be more of um, more free. Um, uh, and as Elvie said, Elvie thought the, the new sh chair should do all that. And I still thought that giving a head start on it made sense. So that, um, we can handle it however this crew wants, um, but um, the agenda that we had, discussion of committees, discussion of committees as a whole, and how we use that, how we handle work sessions. Um, it, it, might, it might be better to just start on the other end and say, what do you guys want to accomplish with this? What, what things are most important? And how do we structure ourselves to do that? Hey, uh, sorry, but uh, do, do you have a copy of the agenda? I think it is kind of helpful. I, um, I gave it out and then I put it right here. So. John's better that he's not crusty tomorrow. and skiing right now. Fred, did you? Informally, it's like most Title 21 issues would go through the Community and Economic Development Committee, but we've generally scheduled those so it doesn't hold anything up. So if it's introduced, we'll meet the next week and have it ready for the following assembly meeting. So it's not a rule; it's just something we've been doing. Yeah. Okay. And you know, as opposed to the legislature, where it came in and it was forced through the committee process, we kind of use it. Either the committee does its own reports and things, or things are referred to it. Um, but they often at, get action with, without going through a committee process. It's sort of as needed. Um, did, what? Did, may I go ahead and introduce myself? To, of course, Julia. Okay, thank you. I'm Fred Dyson. I'm Julia Tucker. I'm the uh, uh, counsel for the assembly. Um, I, uh, my last day in the office is at the end of this month. We have a new... Was there something I said? No. <laughs> no. You said you want to know who the other two people no, are. Kidding. So, so um, uh, our, uh, I had some, uh, a couple of weeks of overlap with Dean Gates, and he was unable to attend this meeting today, so I said I would come in and tell uh, my appointment. So please sit down, Fred. Uh, and and uh, Eugene, introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Eugene Callahan, and I live in Madison, New York. I follow public process. Of the process done appropriately, decision made by the governing body to more likely the public interest. Did you say you're, you're here as an interested citizen, not an official role? I represent myself. Okay. All right. Thank you. I might add that 100 years ago, when I was here before, John Wood, our chair, <laughs> really fought for the assembly to have their own attorney and or almost a forensic accountant. Yeah, this stuff. I'm 
glad to follow up. When, after you left, we did exactly that, because I was seeing legal pins coming down with TF after and before they sent to us, and I asked our attorney, what's TF? That's the mayor. We don't send you anything he hasn't approved. You've got two separate branches of government. Yeah, exactly And that's right. the reason we created her position. It's never going away. Well, good on you. As long as I agree. Dick was instrumental in that, and so now we have a budget analyst and we have a attorney. We have an attorney. That, so we get those legal and financial mm -hmm. perspectives of our own. We've well, got two branches of government. We need to have this checks and balances. Yeah. And she does not work for anybody. She works for all 11 of us. Yeah. So it. you can bring something to her and you've got confidentiality with her. And she would not tell you what she's doing for him or what she's doing for me. But she, she would tell very us if fine it's stupid what we're trying to do. What? <laughs> <laughs> she's very diplomatic about it. Even to those who work with it. So just start LB brought up committees as a whole. And the, the, there's very different. So that is committee where everybody's a member. Um, it, it rains the gamut from those are very, very useful, and LV articulated that very well, to members that have emailed me saying um, it's a big waste of time because you're not letting the committee do what it should. If, if you have a committee on economic development and they look at a marijuana license, you don't have to everybody do that, then everybody hear it again. You let the committee process. And I, I think like in most things, the answer is somewhere in between. There are things that are so vital for all of us that we all probably need to be involved from the start. Budget makes a lot of sense, particularly the, the larger budget decisions, not the sort of minutia, but so you might as well have everyone, everyone else in the beginning down to maybe that example on the marijuana license where it's more efficient to have a committee doing that and then you just bring your report up and we ask questions of it. So the our committee for marijuana, economic development may eventually sort of phase out. We did this initially because of the influx of the new industry. But as we get into the first or second year of renewals, what we deal with is going to go down dramatically. Well, we've already kind of, we've gotten rid of the marijuana committee and we're having you do that. Well, it's in that, work. it's in the economic development committee is where we hear all the marijuana stuff now. And, and that, so homelessness we did as a committee of the whole, just because I think that was exploding and everyone wanted to come back to their constituents to, to have something to say. but. It's probably under public safety and appropriately under the public safety committee. You could, for a similar reason, you might fold homelessness back into public safety now, the way you folded marijuana back into commerce and economic development. Even if you don't fold the committee into the other one, you don't have to have it be a committee as a whole. Am I mistaken that we don't have a cap on number of people in no, our committee? Don't. I mean, so There's committees no here, in some ways, are the opposite of how they function in the legislature. Committees here are work. And the question is just how much more work do you want? And you can join any committee you want. Um, but then, you know, I didn't say you want, but no, you divide it up based on party affiliation, majority and minority. LV asked me if I wanted to be on CED. I was like, I don't want to get up that early for Thursday. So, just to talk about the homeless committee, though, the history of it wasn't a homelessness committee. It was uh, drug and alcohol abuse and other issues. And the fact is that the committee morphed into that because of the administration's drive to tackle homelessness as one of the root causes. And I would suggest that there are so many elements within that context that it would be unwise at this time to eliminate that as a specific focal area. Because I think this mayor is only finally getting to strive with positive improvement, and he needs our support in this issue. That would be my two cents on the topic of homelessness. Well, it's an informal committee. Let's just not talk over each other, but nobody's going to have to be recognized to do it. We have, I listed the committees we have and the number of members, and the CODW is whether they're a committee of the whole. So we have 12 committees, of which three are committees of the whole, budget and finance, homelessness, um, rules, and rules. Oh, public safety is not a committee of the whole? It's listed at least. And, but as, well, Pete, go ahead. What did you said a second ago when other people were talking? I, what you said, I, or I heard, was you can come to any committee you want, whether you're a formal member, and generally you can get on any committee you want um, if you have enough interest. There, it's very rarely that we say, no, you can't be on that committee if you really want to. And, and, if, and if, you, if you're not an official member of that committee, you can still go to those meetings and participate in those meetings. Mm -hmm. You're not limited in your participation just because you're not officially a member of that committee. We've had the problem of people not understanding that because I go to every committee, I'm retired, I have the time to do it. <laughs> but 
we welcome everybody to go to every committee they've got time to go to. Because there's information in every committee that you need. And it works out well. Yeah. Do the committees vote on some on their actions? Yeah, but it's less formal than, than we're used to. Um, we recommend passage. John, you want to talk about your committee? Yeah, we, um, the Community Economic Development Committee, the kind of main thing we've been doing for the year I've been on is um, we review every single marijuana application. And it's somewhat time consuming. We're getting faster, but we'll go through. The applicants will be there. They may talk. Staff will be there and talk on it. Their and we'll there. spend 30 to 40 minutes on each one. And then we'll just decide. We'll say, okay, do what do we recommend? And we recommend <coughs> approval typically um, with maybe some conditions. So then when it comes to the meeting, the regular assembly meeting, when that item comes up for approval, we'll just state the Community and Economic Development Committee recommends approval. But it doesn't stop, Fred. Doesn't. Some, anybody on the summit can vote against it. Yeah. So how do you view, Dick, the difference between a committee of the whole looking at something, rules say as a committee of the whole, or an assembly work session? Sort of what's the difference between those two? The difference is with the rules committee, we let the public testify on an issue. For example, like my precious metals one, we had the rules committee <coughs> hold a public hearing on that. We had the public come and testify on it. We don't, most of the committees, we don't let the public testimony enter into it. That one we did, the rules committee. Yeah, but compared to calling a work session on precious metals. Because the work session then, the public doesn't interact. The work session is closed. It's just for assembly discussion, information coming to the assembly members. The public does participate in work session. But, but at the so end of every meeting, there is usually public comments uh, if there's time available. Not at every work session, Pete. Just at, like the committee of the whole does. Committee meetings. Yeah. And public safety does because there's a block down there. For uh, public comments and there's, homelessness, there's nothing formal to prevent from doing this. That's no, so wrong. You, Weaver can come to the <laughs> what, Did you want to say something? Too? I did. I, I, I'm not. Um, uh, there's just a little fine point about uh, the rules committee and the budget and finance committee. The budget and finance committee is actually set up in code, and so. Um, that it's, a, it's recognized by ordinance and it's in code. The Rules Committee also has a reference in code. And so the Rules Committee has a job that it needs to do um, that was recognized in uh, the Community Council Code. And so, um, and that is that in providing, uh, there's a, a situation with Community Councils where the uh, community councils have to be at arm's length distance from the city because they are, although they're recognized in code, they're not, not part profit. of city government. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's set up by design. But the municipality can provide certain kinds of support to community councils. So the rules committee stepped in when the, and is recognized in code is stepping in, when community councils are, are um, putting together their bylaws, which is mandatory, um, and, and those go to the ombudsman to support to the community council. But if the community council is at odds with what the ombudsman has said, then that's the type of thing that goes to the rules committee, and that's, and that's recognizing code. That's all I'm saying. Sorry. The, I, mean, the, I mean, the point is we wrote that ordinance, and so if we wanted to establish some different procedure, and we Sometimes we're just we're following the things that we've done before, and I did see this as a time where said where we we get to poke our head up and say how do we want to operate, and then write the codes or ordinances or procedures that way. So, so one more time, how, when do we want to operate as a committee, and when do we want to operate all together? And it seems to me the cleanest way to say this is an all together thing. This is is uh, you do a work session. Then, then you're recognizing it's the entire assembly, and and that the and committees do committee, and work session when we think it it's so big that it needs everybody involved. You know, I I have considered the homeless and, bu and uh, budget as committees as partly symbolic, just to let the world know we think this is so important that it's a com committee of the whole and. The work session is as you need it, whereas we have regular homeless committee meetings, and I think particularly that one, we get 20 or more agency people in there focused, on, and some people just from citizens who are very focused on it. 
come to every meeting, and if, I think it focuses their work. We need to show we have something to report every month to the assembly, and I think that helps keep them on track. One, reminds them that we think what you do is important, right. and we get them to focus on their work. So that, that I think, fills an important role. And it's not like there's a particular thing like a marijuana license, again, that you're acting on. You're, you're getting an entire presentation on this very broad subject. For the new members, you guys just got reelected. You just guys got elected, and you were going door to door. What was the major concerns? Homelessness, <coughs> police, <coughs> taxes. Mm -hmm. Those are the major concerns, mm -hmm. and the reason we have the committees to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's. A, I mean, I like the way Dick phrased that. You guys have been most recently knocking on doors. What are you here? That's accurate. But, I mean, crime definitely that came up for me number one when in talking to people. Yeah, crime, um, homelessness, uh, plowing, um, snow yeah, snow removal, um, taxes. and taxes, and maybe to a lesser degree every now and then uh, we get folks uh, complaining about um, very specific things like a knock on a developer's door or someone who does that and they complain about Title 21. Mm -hmm. Pete? Yeah. Um, a lot, of, a lot of complaints about snow removal this winter, more than we were anticipating. Well, it's a bifurcated issue, too, because we've got to find out what are they talking about. Some of the streets are owned by the city, some are owned by the state. But when people call us, they don't mm -hmm. care who owns it. Mm -hmm. They simply want it cleared. Right. So so we when we start to put a budget together, you know, early next fall, um, we probably need to consider, do we need to buy more equipment? Do we need to hire more drivers to move this snow? Because we don't, we don't know what kind of winter we're going to have next year. And we don't want to get burned again. I don't think we do. Well, Pete, do you remember last year's budget where I tied that a million dollars more into snow removal? And I was told by the administration, don't worry about it. If we need more money, we'll come to you and ask for it. Well, the problem wasn't the money in the budget. The problem was we had all of our equipment and all of our people out there, and we couldn't get it. We couldn't catch up. Fred's no. waiting. You were <coughs> never this shy before. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm not changing the subject. We have a marvelous road service area, and we hire a contractor that does it. We're always 18 or 24 hours ahead of the city here and getting things plowed out. And it works marvelously, and it's the cheapest per lane mile anywhere in the state. And, uh, and, and because it's locally controlled, we set our own taxes for it. And, and the c contractor's glad to have winter work, you know, for his crew and his equipment and so on. And we have a list of all the handicapped people and the seniors and stuff, and the foremen have plows. They go back out and plow out those individual ones. Just genius. So, uh, Anna Fairclaw McKinnon, uh, who is always smarter than me and ahead of me, I had a brilliant idea. Why don't we talk to State DOT about our road board plowing out the state roads that are within it? And they figured it out, and the only sticking point is reimbursement for the local road board. But it is. DOT saves money, you know, because it's cheaper per lane mile and so on. And, you know, it's a genius idea making it work in a larger area, but, and we'll get pushback from the public employees, you know, them losing jobs, you know, and, but the, it, it, it works really well, cheaper, quicker. And uh, uh, you all had real problems. So much snow gets plowed out onto the on the sidewalks, and and the people can't walk, and then they're walking in the right of way, you know, and those berms get really hard. I mean, all of you were out putting up signs trying to jam the sign down into a frozen berm. So but right. anyways, there's a solution out there. First steps have been taken, you know, and it can work. It's be hard. I've got a couple, three homeless people that I've been trying to help fruitlessly, I might add, you know. But I bought shovels for them, and they were making money shoveling out people's driveways and so on and so forth. You know, and maybe there's a, a way we can put homeless folks to work, too. 
sorry, I just said, told you more than I know. No, all good stuff. So the, the local area, the local service areas are defended on in, in the hillside and there, and, and they often bring a much more efficient deal, and, and that's why the people love them. It's harder to replicate in Anchorage, but we have done at a, the tour at a, at a larger level where we, in a big way, sh shared with the state. Instead of us pulling up our plow because it's a yeah, state road and moving. That happened. Yeah. Started a long time. Yeah, we divide up the labor. So not as efficient, but more efficient than it yep. was. Um, and then Ethan has been doing with the homeless clearing out homeless stuff, right? H homeless are clearing out trash as a so, employment opportunity. Yeah. And the answer to that in the winter, I think, is actually set them to work if they're interested at the bus stops and the, the transit corridors that people use that can allow people to use our sidewalks where they need them as opposed to, they can't do it everywhere, but we can target them. And so I fully agree. And you know, the issue I heard at the door, crime was one, it was threefold. Petty crime, stuff getting stolen by homeless folks to take into the camps. It was the camps, and the camps are a real nuisance issue that we have to figure out without just displacing folks. And then there's kind of the drug and serious crime issue that people are afraid of, like in South Edition in particular, with serial killer issues. People are pretty panicked about that. The tax issue in my neighborhood, more than anything I heard people say, we are willing to pay more if we can get services that work and better for our city. Mm -hmm. I swear that I heard that over and over in my neighborhood. I'm not making that up. And uh, it's a, a key infrastructure. Access into it and out of the downtown is difficult because we're jamming all the cars and not paying attention to where the people live. Mm -hmm. And that's causing public safety hazards. It's causing transportation bottlenecks. And we need a special investigation of the downtown is what I've been hearing. What were you hearing at the door? You, you were going to other stuff, but. Yeah, well, I didn't go door to door. <laughs> but, uh, but Fred didn't need to. Okay. <laughs> Everybody knows Fred. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so scattered, it's yeah. very it would be difficult to do. Mm -hmm. yeah, and first time I ever put signs up on snowshoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, the crime issue, and I mean, all these things we've got to get into later on. But I have been very involved in the reformation of the criminal justice system and the paradigm we're following has been done in other states quite successfully. Every one of the crimes gone down and recidivism has <clears throat> while saving money and treatment went up. But there are just I think twenty three or twenty four amendments to the SB ninety one. SB ninety one and so on. But one of the, I'm very consistent. And I consistently make the same mistakes time after time. And I would do something I thought was really neat, walk away and say, boy, that was a great thing. Eric and I worked on some of them, patting myself on the back. The thing went to ditch for poor execution. And the crime stuff has got several bottlenecks that never got fixed. We're way short on prosecutors. We're short on court time. The cops are... <coughs> often in uh, playing triage and, and so on. And the bail schedule never got fixed. You know, and all of those are executive branch sorts of things that really plug it up. And a typical thing, we want people, people are not gonna stay in prison forever. We want them to re-enter successfully. And uh, a felony rap, there are 430 jobs in this town you can't get with a felony rap. Most of them are silly. You know, and so on. But if you can get the person to not have a very bad record when it's inappropriate, and Forrest worked with me, and we got the stupidest drug law that I knew this state had, and got it changed, you know, and, and so on. But those things are. are what was that? Oh, just uh, for the very low level simple possession, it was an automatic felony for Schedule One. And so we got reduced to a class C misdemeanor. And it was stupid. I've had five major surgeries in the last eight years. Guess what? I've got some oxycodone in my medical cabinet. And I've got some in my remote cabinet. I'm guilty of felony. If your kid is out driving with one of your buddies and there's a wreckable amount of coke crystals on the floor, you know, you're guilty of a felony. You don't have to have proved it was used or sold. Simple possession. And you know, it was, it was just dumb. Where was I going with that? 
Sorry, I'm distracting uh, you guys. So, the technical problems on the enforcement end of it, you know, and the process of getting solved, most of the bad rap about SB 91 was uh, stupid stuff on the execution. The one we didn't figure on, it says you get a property crime, you, you know, uh, shoplifting or stealing those headlights off a of Lexus, it, you know, it, the second time you get arrested for that, it, you know, it's up to class B, misdemeanor, and so on and so forth. The, the law we wrote said conviction. So we got shoplifters out there, we've got eight arrests, but no conviction. And they keep getting, and it's all the lower end. Yeah, and the cops can't cuff them and, and lock them up. You know, nobody thought of that one. And the business owners, pardon me, the business owners are upset about it. Well, sure they are. Because they can do nothing with shoplifters. Mm -hmm. well, the one thing awesome. on that subject that's been really a problem that I've seen directly because of my personal employment is that the promise of SB 91 was we will provide the recidivism programs and the funding for treatment services. And the administration has not provided those funds or they have cut those funds for fear of what's coming with the budget. And so we have all of these folks being discharged from the institutions, but Without they're, the they're cutting millions of dollars of treatment services. And so there's a false promise operating there and it's yep. pretty consistent over time that that happens, but that's what we're dealing with in some ways on yep. the street. And, and it's really true. And it's another longer discussion, but I had a bill in and I got it all the way through the Senate to the last committee and I got killed by my pal Stoltz. But it would have put eight or nine million more into treatment that needed to be done. That and never happened to us before yeah. that. I never got it that far. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, but you're absolutely right. And you all know just intuitively, there's a sweet spot in how time, much time they lock somebody up. If you lock them up for long enough, they lose their family, lose their job, you know, and so on and so forth. You almost always put them in a grad school of how to be a more serious criminal. You know, and there's sweet spots, perhaps, <laughs> and over vocation, but you got to be smart about that. Part of the reason I thought this was important and appreciate you guys coming is for this discussion and for an understanding. You know, we're, we're, we're going to leave in an hour or so, so everyone can enjoy this. Nice Saturday, but understanding of what we what we want to achieve, what we want to work on, the, the sometimes the assembly gets to be a very reactive body. We just do the agenda that comes for us, or we're deferring completely to the administration's definition of where they want to go. And I mean that can be all right, but it it leads if you if we don't define the goals that we want over two years, and then have some idea when we achieve them, some measure, then. Um, it's hard to know when you got there, right? It's hard to know the, the guy, and and it's not being anti this administration. You know, Ethan for a while and like him very much, but I think it's easier for him to deal with us when we are able to say, here's what we're interested in doing with these three or four things, and he says, well, I'm concentrating on these three or four things, and hopefully a lot of them line up, and where they don't, at least we're very clear about, well, you know, what. Well, our fourth thing, why isn't that important to you, or whatever. You can have a rational then discussion, and both sides have done what they need to in terms of their branch of government, but still ha yeah, have its own presence, have its own view. I, I do think most of them are going to line up, but I, but I think even with someone I like very much, it's not doing our job to just mm -hmm. defer to it, just mm -hmm. let them do. So I have three quick things, two specific, and then one to the broader policy point that you just made. So the first is on the snow removal, which we were talking about earlier. Um, I tried to set up a joint uni-state um, town hall with uh, Fred's former chief of staff, now Representative Chuck Cox. Unfortunately, it didn't work out because they're just stuck in Juneau. But once they come back, I think that's something we should do and, and have it in the public where the state and the uni are talking together. Because when you when you talk to either of them, they always blame each other. Right. And right. we need to have a public forum where they both lay out what happened this winter. And then we allow the public a chance to discuss possible solutions. And that might be more funding or it might be something else. You know, there are other cities that are very aggressive, for example, about towing people out of right-of-ways, um, which is a big deal. But, uh, well, but I'm thinking more like Minneapolis does this. But I'm not sure if that's something that our city would tolerate, but it's something that we should at least discuss. The second uh, point is on the, tr you know, we were talking about the committee's structure. We want to keep all these committees 
Uh, I think that Chris has articulated, and I agree, that the Homeless Committee should stay. The Transportation Committee that I set up, I, I think it has another year or so of usefulness based on the implementation of the ordinance that we passed in December and um, the likelihood that Uber or Lyft is going to come into town. And I think there's going to be one more ordinance that we'll have to do to allow the taxi some kind of restructure of the regulatory burden to allow the taxi industry to, to compete with Uber and Lyft. But I've found it very difficult to get the taxi industry to help yeah. me tell me what they want because all they want is to sue us or repeal us or whatever. Call us idiots on Instagram. Um, uh, so that is a, a committee that I think at some point we might consider winding down. Uh, in general, committees are, I do think that, and Pat Flynn has articulated this to me before, that we should resist the over-proliferation of committees because they consume our time. And I think the number and type of this committees that we have right now is pretty close to good. If someone could come with you to really compelling, we really need this, I'd be open to it. Um, but I think that the, the structure committees we have now is pretty good. And the last point I'll make, stop monopolizing the time, is what you were getting at, Eric, which is my first, especially the first few months I was on this body, I was very frustrated by the lack of this kind of discussion that happens. And for the new members, you might not realize how kind of unique this is, but we are in many ways very reactive. We, we, um, we, we talk and we sort of make sausage on the dais, and then we have work sessions and um, hearings, committee meetings, but they're very agenda driven and there isn't a lot of back and forth kind of between the members. It's usually you interviewing the people from the administration um, and there's this, there's this almost, not pathological is the wrong word, but there, we're always saying like this is the wrong time for this, this is the wrong time to have this kind of talk, the wrong time to have this kind of conversation. And what ends up happening is you never have that conversation because the Open Meetings Act prevents us from doing the kind of sit-down talks that they do with the legislature. The one exception might be, I think, John C. D. Committee, where there is kind of, in my experience at least, this very sort of detail-oriented talking through specific issues. Um, but I would be in favor of us doing something like this with a little more regularity. And I'm surprised nobody showed up to, to um, not, not nobody. Yeah, but I mean, I'm surprised there aren't more people from the public here. But but the idea that we have a place to sit and talk, and we don't necessarily have to have people from the administration or people from the public intrude on our conversation, I think is very valuable. Did you want? Did you, oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, Fred. You know, I react a little bit. But I'm an engineer, and I may be somewhere on the autism spectrum and take things too literally, <coughs> and exaggerations always trouble with me, but I'm the one that has to make an adaptation. I think the open meetings thing works okay in the legislature. You can have these very pointed discussions and so on and so forth. You can make no decisions you know, and so on. And the problem is uh, if, if it's an open meeting, you can't say something that needs to be said that's publicly unpopular. And, uh, and you can't get in my face and so on and so forth, and you can't talk. We sat here at, with a public union contract, and the leader of the union was ranting and raving. We had a guy on our assembly, Joe Evans, who was a... I remember Joe. Uh, he was a labor lawyer. He was. And Joe was smart, and he said, time out, Mr. You Chairman. need a refill? Yeah. He said, uh, let's take a break. Took the union leader back there at the table. Joe sat down and said, most of what you're saying is BS. What's going on? And he says, i got to say these things for my members. And Joe says, okay, so how can we let you posture for your message and the, and the city not get messed over and, and so on and so forth? And they worked out a deal. The union guy couldn't have said that in public, you know, and so on and so forth. And and all of us will have some of the same things. We are wanting to posture a bit or afraid of saying some other things and so on. And, and it's a, it makes an almost impossible, makes a difficult thing to have the very thing we're having here. Well, but we're having it, Fred. So I had the same, or I had the different view. I thought we could have done much better in the legislature. I thought the legislature's writing itself at the open, out of the Open Meetings Act was, was bad. 
but I had a lot, of, you know, a lot, of, particularly the older legislators, um, Ben Grusendorf in particular, when Ethan and I tried to open it up, just said, I'm, I'm leaving. When you want to do real business, I'll come back and we do it. In, that's the way we do it, it's closed doors. We are having that conversation. You are able to say, uh, and, and the press could be here, and maybe the next time we do this, they will be. So I, I worry that we exaggerate the, uh, the inability to talk publicly about things. We can say, um, we don't, we don't have a, a good solution on the, or, so take public safety. What, what I would say is that we have this mush of three different legitimate concerns. We have a homelessness issue, which rarely leads to sort of petty crime, some shoplifting, uh, uh, quality of life crimes. We have an opiate addiction that we're not talking about that leads to some serious thefts, break-ins and, uh, and, and that's, sometimes blamed on homelessness when it really ain't that. And we have a serious crime, murder and, and others, that, and, and the three worries get kind of mushed together when they're tremendously different solutions, right? The, a homeless solution for that level versus an opiate solution versus what's going on with murder, we have different solutions, tools, approaches, it's just, and, and yet they, they get, my car got broken into there, there's this damn homeless camp down the way, they must have done it, and the murder rate's high discussion. And, and so, and, and we can have that public discussion about, in fact, we can facilitate an understanding by saying, I think that's going on, let's bring in the people who really know and educate us and talk about it, and so is that true, and are they different, and how do we do it? And let the press in. Yeah, and, but then, so you're worried, and, and maybe you're right, but I think the more we try it, the more we practice it, we may find there's not very much we can't say publicly. Well, I go back to what you were saying, Forrest, and that is that there's a, this is a good vehicle for having strategic planning conversations. Essentially, we're sitting through what I would describe in my past experience as a strategic planning moment. And your agenda is rather ironic or interesting in that you've broken out the work in section one and then strategic planning in section two. And in essence, it wouldn't be unwise, it would, it would be smart probably to schedule a quarterly or a semi-annual one of these that we discuss strategic direction in relationship to the work we're doing and where we're going. So in a way we're modeling an, an opportunity that we could do right now moving forward to capture what you were saying, a way to make sure that we're meeting our personal or kind of collective goals. I think that's absolutely right. It made the agenda maybe backwards. We need to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and Chris sort of stole my thunder. I wrote down strategic plan here. I, you know, I come from the organizer ba uh, background, and so I like to have things very organized and plans. And you know, one of the things um, that uh, the uh, I don't think this is privileged information, but one of the things the administration did, sort of the first year of the administ their administration, they had a strategic planning session where they brought all the, all the different departments and they said one year, five, three year, six year, assuming things, uh, what do we want to do? Um, so, you know, I think this is great that we have that platform. I also, you know, um, one of the things uh, that I'm going to be taking over from LV is the Let's Move uh, committee. And um, one of the things that they do very well, they have, um, a work plan of five goals that the committee wants to achieve, and they're almost done achieving their five goals, and they're going to do another five goals that they want to achieve. So, you know, for some committees, it may not function that way, but like in homelessness and public safety and a few others, it makes sense to have some type of work plan that's informed by our overall strategic plan. Absolutely, and, that, and, and I think we should just flip it. It started with me thinking about how, how do we want things to look, and it got to the other, but they really go the other way. Yeah, I'm coming to the, um, Suzanne, yeah. Oh, just a question as to what does it look like for the assembly to have a strategic plan? I mean, is that something you vote on? I can see where, like, the committees and the committee of the whole reflect um, public concern and priorities. So, I mean, you could tease out from that that this is what the assembly, you know, views as the greatest priorities, but, if, but I mean, what does that look like? Yeah, I don't know, because we've, we've really never done okay. it that way. We've right. actually done retreats before, Eric, where we've done that, the retreats. Yeah. We haven't done a retreat in the last couple of years. We'd go down before, down to Gurgwood area and have a retreat. 
we talk about where we want to go. It's kind of cliched, but there's an, a saying in the planning world that strategic plans are dead, long live strategic planning. It's not about the formal document you create, but the process mm -hmm. in which you engage in the discussion that helps you all collectively see the same direction. And so okay. I think that you're right, the committees reflect the priorities. Mm -hmm. And in a way, if the committees have charters or goals sure. set out either by the administration or the assembly, that functions as a strategic plan. But okay. I guess yeah, don't they don't tied. have goal. They're no. reactive too, don't but they have a more of a agenda. They have a okay. more of a jurisdiction, okay. maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, I've got some couple things I would like for us to say to the state. You huh. need to do X and Y. Legislature can pass a resolution. So, are we guided by Masons or Roberts? Roberts. Roberts. So it's okay. a little bit of a shift. Yeah, three or but, four particular. But <clears throat> Roberts has some provisions. That the legislature. We had another one we could do as the sense of the legislature, and we could do that with our strategic plan. And we've come up with some priorities and things we want to work on, and it's a sense of the Anchorage Assembly that. that Let's let's flip that around then. Flip the agenda around. I think that's that's right. What do you want to work on over the next two years? That is, what would be if we get to the end of two years and said we did, we concentrated on and did in some way that we can have a goal mm -hmm. that you can actually mm -hmm. measure. That's then mm -hmm. you really know what to do. We did it, but at least concentrated on and made progress on what? Yeah, and I've thought about that quite a bit. Uh, and uh, we can't avoid the financial issues. And we're not as bad a shape as the state, but there's no easy way to get new revenue without a charter amendment. And so we've got to deal with that. And we're going to end up making decisions on triage. We just can't do everything. And on the list of things that have to be done, each one of us will say, oh, wait a minute, you know, don't mess with parks and rec or whatever, but it's got to be done. We can't avoid it on the revenue, the spending side, the long-term plans, all of that. So we can't avoid that. And I don't like it, but I'm really committed to doing it. Let me do it this way. Let's go around yep. and say, and then I'll come back, or you want to add another one? Yeah. Okay. Well, either way. Yeah. So it's a crime issue. Yeah. we got to deal with it and so on. The homeless one, there's good things we can nibble on the edges. We're not going to solve it unless you can change human nature and so on. Then I have my own stuff. Most of you are not interested in it. Or, you know, I'm not, that's not critical. Human rights, civil liberties, and crimes against children, and trafficking children. And, and I won't let that keep me from doing the big things, but those are my passions. Chris? I definitely would say human rights and civil rights are pretty important to me. So we'd have some I know you around. both, you may have a different definition of what you're talking <laughs> about here, but let's go. We'll, we'll very well. But yeah, actually, I have a really crystal clear um, mandate that I'm working on. And, and there are all the issues, public safety, that are being taken care of homelessness. But for me, the number one issue is transportation through the downtown core and the impacts of transportation on land use because the roads are killing our neighborhood and they have for 40 years by design and intent. And I need to make sure that the city and the state change the way they think about how cars are moving through the downtown because it's stealing value, it's making life hard. And so that's my number one priority. Of course. So I guess I, before I talk about my two priorities, I'd say that, Fred, I, I, you probably know this, but we do in the fall put together a legislative program that we send to the state uh, through the mayor's office essentially. And I think we need to rethink how we do that a little bit because we've been treating it like kind of a fire and forget missile. We give it the admin, they go down there with their lobbyists and then, at least in my experience, nothing happens. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I don't like that because Fred's absolutely right that what's happening with the state is, is really kind of the challenge of our time right now. And we have to be working our relationship with the state. And so I think one of the changes I'd like to see maybe in the committee level or how we do this is the legislative committee, which has sort of stood up during the fall and then hasn't met in the last then four months. We should be meeting at least once and probably a couple times during the legislative session and getting updates from our lobbyists that we pay for and from, and maybe sending people down there. I mean, we, we just need to be much more involved in the actual legislative program. 
because a lot of things that I want to accomplish, we can't do without the state's permission, essentially, because we are a creature of the state. Um, things like, I know the administration is moving forward with, um, the tax abatement program to allow us to do some of the redevelopment downtown and other, and other places. Um, so that, that is one of the structural changes I want to see. And the two primary, primary goals that I have for my time on the assembly, the assembly as a whole, that are very much related to that are one, navigating the sort of ship of state through a very stormy time financially. Um, if we just survive the next two years, that'll be a tremendous accomplishment. That is, if, if, this, if the people of Anchorage think that we have done a good job of getting us through these waters and um, you know things aren't great, but at least we haven't collapsed the way the state has in some places, that'll be a major accomplishment. The second one is more aspirational and maybe more long-term, and that is turning Anchorage into the kind of place where a young family wants to move and, um, and raise that family and turning us into one of these fun, cool, hip places and that's about quality of life, and that's about the downtown, that's about our parks and trails, that's about public safety. Everything is tied into that, and that's the lens I see. Um, but again, the, the concrete recommendation I have coming out of that is that we restructure the way that we are dealing with the legislature. Right now, we are too reliant on the administration in my view. Dick. You know, the assembly sets policy, not the administration. The administration executes the policy we set, and we tend to forget that every now and then. And on the assembly, we've got two types of assembly members. I've been here for a while. We have those that'll do something, and those that are part of plans that don't want to offend anybody. I've got two years left on the body. I can't run again unless the Supreme Court has some. <laughs> I don't know about it. I want to make sure we get positive things done. I brought some tax issues forward. We need some more tax increases. Nobody in the body would vote for it to send the voters because they were afraid of election time. Elections are over with. We've got to take a hard look at the taxes and figure out what makes sense for this town. Because unlike the state, the state, you guys cannot, um, you because you guys were there, cannot dedicate fund streams. The city can. I can dedicate an alcohol tax for alcohol treatment. I can dedicate it for, you know, detox centers. The state can't. Let's use that ability and try and address the financial problems. I agree we're not as bad as the state are, but they're going to suck us into the abyss they're going into if we're not careful. I mean, the state's responsibility has so many responsibilities in the state constitution, education, and public safety. They're abrogating both the responsibility. And we're the ones having to pick it up. Look at the problem along turning an arm with public safety. You really think we're not going to send our police and firemen down there? There's an access. I'm sorry, that's controlled by the state. You're not going to go. We're going to have to send our own people down there. So I'll work with you on anything you have, because like I said, I'm used to being involved. And I can tell you some colleagues that are named Juneau now, there were nothing but a potted plant sitting on the dice up there. Careful, don't name names. <laughs> I have in the past, I'm more than willing to do it again. They're nice people, but they do nothing. I'd rather us get things done. And there's gonna be intellectual risk and some political risk when you do that. But why are you really here? To make effective change or just watch a ship go by? My primary goal is the future generation. I have 17 grandkids living in Anchorage. And I, sorry, <laughs> I want to make sure basketball team. <laughs> this is the type of town they should live in and keep them here. It's almost a whole hockey team. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then the hockey team. players. Uh, <laughs> get a football team. And that's enough for me. Sorry. <laughs> it's difficult for me to tease out the different issues. And what I mean by that is the fiscal crisis has such a big impact, I mean, on public safety and, and funding priorities. And from talking to people just in our neighborhood, which has, you know, a lot of families, um, people are talking about leaving, people are talking about moving, are really wondering if... Um, this is their future. Yes, ex ex exactly. If the schools are going to be good, if um, it's going to be a safe place to live, and I know from you know conversations with how the budget has been handled, public safety is the only area that hasn't been cut. But then when the state is abdicating um, its responsibility, I think, along turning an arm and in plowing roads, it seems to me that separating some of that out and establishing um, how the city takes responsibility and then explains to people why spending might go up because of that, 
is challenging. So I'm still processing. <laughs> it, it, I, I know you both, uh, yeah, are new, so it's it's hard to. But but the more particular aspect of committees you want, how do you think you should mm -hmm. redo rules? That right. you know you need more time to know. But sort right. of what do you want to work on and what right. do you want to do? Yeah, I went on the legislative committee actually because you know. Okay, but I was just saying that <laughs> was okay. the conversation. The conversation okay. was. I thought you were asking what do you want to. Well, what do you want to? Yeah, leave here in two years. Year yeah, three, but accomplish. Yeah, I mean, get that I mean, straightened out with what's the responsibility of the city and what's with the state and what, you know, are we taking control of and expanding those conversations about public safety. So, I mean, if the city is going to have to, you know, take yeah. on that responsibility for turning an arm, that sort of blows my mind. That's a corridor in, in state use. So, I'm not answering your question well, you very are, well. well. I think that's okay. But it's still yeah, part of the city. It's, it's still, still it's right, exactly. Saying, it's still part the, of the city. The new members right. have got a little different pers perspective than those of us who've been on the body, because mm -hmm. you're sort of looking from outside. Right. So right. you might see things from that side that we don't see from that side. So if you have observations like that, now would be mm -hmm. a great time to bring those forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, you know. Felix has got a list. I, I do yeah. have a list. That's, I'm telling you, organized. That's yeah. what I do. So, um, <laughs> so as, aside from public safety and homelessness, which is obviously something that we all heard um, throughout this last campaign cycle, you know, I have a few things here. Um, one of the things, particularly in Midtown, I said this all the time, Midtown is the biggest center of uh, lack of coordination uh, and dealing with how we do snow plowing. So I really want to, uh, you know, uh, tagging on what Forrest said, really want to see how we can re-envision the relationship between the state and the muni, specific to snow plowing, although I know there's a mm -hmm. whole list of things we need to re-envision. Um, then, uh, you know, one of the things that I heard a lot, specifically when it comes to revenues, uh, that a lot of people are sick and tired of whether it's churches or nonprofits not paying their fair share. Um, and I know there's there's a lot of that state level stuff that we have to get permission, but we, there are some um, examples of, for example, the Unitarian Universalist Church that does pay taxes. So That's the only one that does payment lieu of taxes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I, I wrote that down. Thank you. Uh, so you know, why can't we uh, go and use our role as a bully pulpit and say you you are a part of the city, you get these services. Mm -hmm. Frankly, you need to be paying uh, some part of for that. Yes, so, can I uh, come in there for just one second to comment yeah. on that? So I think that actually it ties into what I said too, because you're absolutely right. We can't do those things without the state changing their mind. And I went and talked to the administration yesterday, the day before, about this, and they basically said we're going forward with the tax abatement thing. We're going forward with the um, the sprinkler tax issues, another thing we talked about, yeah. and we're just not gonna we're not gonna even try on that. Because mm. it's too controversial, because of the seniors, actually, is the real issue. Mm. Um, but that's a perfect example where we told them specifically, do these things. And that was one of them. It was like, give us, you don't have to eliminate them, you just have to give the state, give, have the state give permission to localities to determine for themselves whether they want to do this or not, make right. it non mandatory. Yeah. And the administration didn't pursue it. And, and that's why I think our legislative committee has to have a little more oomph to it. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I no, think, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. If you want to take that one on, start with Providence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't start with no. Jerry Prevo, the kingdom. Yeah. Start with well. Providence. <laughs> and anybody that says Providence isn't making money is ignorant. Oh, I, they when are. When I first got on the body, I had the Let the man finish, and then we'll come back around. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. And I actually, someone point blank asked me that if you're going to go after Providence, and I point blank said, yes, we need to. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And, and I heard that too. Their services. <laughs> um, so, you know, another, another uh, priority for me, I just have two more. Um, so, uh, public transit is a huge priority for me. Um, you know, I was just at my last public transit advisory board meeting where we had a, a room full of people who some of them in tears about the changes that we're making to the public transit system and how it's going to basically completely uh, affect their everyday lives um, for the negative. Um, so, how can we, uh, with the resources we have and with the changes that were announced last week, you know, how can we um, effectuate those changes and look to the future? Uh, and, you know, especially 
you know, when I talk about my personal budget priorities, that always came forward as one of my personal budget priorities, just so you all know. Um, and then public comment. Um, so, you know, especially if we're talking about, you know, we're talking about these next two, three years and how this is going to be such uh, a difficult budget time and how we're going to really look at triaging. I want to really make sure that we have a robust public comment outside of what we might normally do for um, the, the budgets. You know, how can we really be out there in the community, whether it's town halls, etc., to really get folks' uh, uh, opinions and thoughts. That's, that's that. Love it. John? It always surprised me that you read the comments on the Daily News, oh. you listen to talk radio, and they're screaming and living with problems. They're not about the budget. They're spending seven so on. We had two public hearings on it, and we got some artists came in. It's like, fun this for another $20,000. Where are these people? You know, it, it's crazy. Um, but it kind of broadly, I think people have sense. You know, I mean, I've spent decades doing hillside stuff. So we've got a hillside district plan I was real involved with a decade ago. And like that park service area came out of the hillside district plan. We've got a drainage road reorganization that will be pushing next. I don't know if we fail too, but I think it's a good idea. It should be done. Um, we're looking at septic and a lot of crossover legal river kind of stuff, septic and well issues, you know, how to make that work better. So I'm going to keep chipping away at things that are in the hillside district plan. And, and we are starting to talk about road service areas taking over state roads, so we need to get together because we're starting to chip away at it. It sounds like you're a little further with Anna. Jennifer accepts this, but I think she's too busy down there to make progress. <coughs> um, but that's something, we, it's a tied in thing. So I was surprised with you doing that with Chuck Cop too, but the Lurses all uh, have a real avenue to do what the city's been doing on these road things. Um, but then, uh, and, and of course, public safety on the sewer highway is defined as a South Anchorage issue, but it is a citywide issue just like anything else. We need to find some solution. Um, but then broader issues, kind of like Chris was talking about, kind of transportation and land use development um, have just been a hobby of mine for a long time too, kind of broader citywide things. And that's, as far as committees go, being on the AMATS committee and the Community Economic Development Committee, because those go hand in hand. What we're learning at Community Economic Development as we do the new Metropolitan Transportation Plan starting now, um, com com that combined interest, you can't unlock those two things. So that's the truth we need to be. Um, so those committees, to me, are real interesting in the broader spectrum. And not to say homeless is not, um, I think that's a big deal. I think there's other people that have their heads wrapped around better than I have. So it's not been my personal agenda, but I'm not ignoring that at all. I think it's very, very important. <coughs> And the public safety too. And the crime's not in South Anchorage, but people there feel it. You know, they, you get mm -hmm. um, someone went into your neighbor's garage and stole a bicycle. You feel violated. You know, you do. Even more than the shoot, it bothers you more because that, you're not going to get shot at 3 a.m. downtown. Somebody steal my bicycle out of my garage. So everyone feels that. Um, but but I think so. My focus has been pretty clear. I think in the last year, on those kind of hillside things. And then another goal is to do whatever the Girdwood Board of Supervisors asks me to do. That's amazing. I just do what they tell me. Pete? Yeah. Just one last thing, John, on Girdwood. A couple of times we've gone to Girdwood, take the whole assembly down there, mm -hmm. LES, to hold an assembly meeting there. We need to do that again. So the Girdwood feels we understand them, we care about what happens. So I'd be interested in us taking the whole assembly down there for a meeting. We've done it in the past. Like literally an assembly meeting or a hearing? Assembly right? meeting down in Girdwood. Yeah. We've done it. Ever done it to Eagle River? It's been right. about two years. Not in Girdwood. We've done it to Girdwood right there. If we're doing it in Girdwood, we've got to do it to Eagle River. I'm not sure they want to go to Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we want you city boys to stay here. <laughs> well, I, I agree that uh, the legislative committee has been less than effective. And part of that has been that they basically hardly ever met. You know, when I was first put on that committee, when I was first elected, I would ask Jennifer Johnson, so when, when, when's, when are we meeting? Oh, that committee doesn't meet. I'm going to hell have a committee if it doesn't meet. You know, so finally we got together and had wine over on Patrick's deck one time, and that was that was our meeting that year. A couple years ago. <laughs> you know, and so I, I think there's a, a lot more that the legislative committee could do. And there was absolutely no coordination uh, as far as lobbying the legislature is concerned, I was in Juneau for the uh, Alaska Municipal League Conference, and in between meetings there, I went up and met, you know, legislators up on the hill, and 
you know, I'd gotten a hold of our lobbyists thinking we'd go together to some of these legislators' offices, but no, they set my schedule up totally separate from their own. So, you know, I think if you, you know, if we organize, you know, three of us or four of us and go to Juno at the same time and go to these offices, especially since some of us used to be in the legislature, I, you know, I think we might be able to make some headway. And not just lobbying about money, but getting, getting some, you know, legislation change that might allow us to change, you know, charge more for, you know, sprinkler exemptions or, or whatever. You know, that we, we had a list of, of non-capital things on, on our legislative wish list this year that I don't think any of those got handled. Well, one of, I think one of them is getting close, but that is how things have changed, right? We're not asking for money anymore. There's no money to ask for. Now we're asking for substantive policy changes. That right. takes a little more effort. So, so part of the reason I think that that the strategic planning bled in the committee, just like Suzanne Wright went from, I want to do this to I want to be on this committee. And the, the, this discussion then, right, leads us to, hey, let's take the legislative committee from, you said fire and forget missile, where we send it down, whatever, into, and what I was playing with is, it's, it's uh, state and federal issues, right? And so we, it not only does that, so it goes from almost doing nothing, writing a thing that is ignored often, to more actively working that, and how do we, it has jurisdiction then to handle the sort of, how do we handle the state's fiscal imploding? So it is, how do we function within both federal and state? How do we communicate with them? What do we ask them to do? And how do we survive their difficulties? How do we work with them? And and then it goes from, from almost irrelevant to really crucial, right? It, it, it's got a jurisdiction now that, that really has some interesting things to do. And, and the Transportation Committee, which you're going to take different places, but it was originally kind of a where do we deal with the taxi thing, yeah. has buses and roads and has, has all kinds of... Well, I've been trying to keep it out of that because I see that more as AMATs and sort of a, a transit issue. Well, then that's why we have these discussions, right? We say, no, I think we do need a transportation committee that's more than the taxi committee. And if that's what you want to do, we want you to understand that it has a big jurisdiction. So sure. those discussions put us back to, okay, now let's redo our committees in this way with some real goals of where they go. Yes, sir. I want you to tell us what you want to do, and then I have a comment on this discussion. Well, I really think, uh, you know, sort of Tuesday night is where people can say, here's my vision and you vote for me kind of thing. I really meant this to be more all of us, but, but that would be one concrete proposal, that we take legislative and reformat the state and federal relations, and we explicitly tell whoever's going to be that chair, this isn't just the fire and forget wish list. This is coordinated, and it and you should have hearings with the mayor and others about what's coming down the pike. How do we avoid it? How do we solve it? So go ahead. What else do you want to accomplish? Oh next yeah. Year or two? Yeah. So um, uh, it's worked into other parts of the conversation, but public safety is huge, and I, I particularly think I want more data. But the data I've collected so far is we have these three simultaneous very different things. Uh, so uh, we're doing, I think, um, uh, uh, on homelessness uh, the the right thing. That is, within Jim Williams, I think Ethan has the right plan. We've ignored an opiate um, addiction explosion that we need to start talking about. And it's led to those kind of bicycle crimes. I think it's much more likely that that is somebody trying to get money for an addiction than it is a homeless person or Mm -hmm. the murderer population. Um, it's it's that. And so that we can deal with, or we can address. So teasing that out, learning more about it. Um, and I'm very interested in the enterprises and utilities. Um, that is how we manage businesses and allow them to operate in a business-like way while having appropriate oversight for, for their pub, recognizing their public uh, ownership and an appropriate uh, dividend or payment back that is neither using it as a way around the tax cap to, to use that as a cash cow, but contributes something to the overall. Uh, and so balancing uh, management autonomy with oversight and appropriate amount of money to us without bleeding it. 
I'm interested in that on the port, on MLNP, on solid waste, on a. All right. <clears throat> By the way, one thing I didn't say earlier with the Title 21 or whatever it is, it's a huge <laughs> issue for Amy and I. And we want it. One of us at least, and preferably both of us, to be on that. And our issue is the carve out for Eagle River. We won't mess with you guys very much, although I think you're way off base <laughs> trying to make the city too nice and have government dictating aesthetics. And it's just a very different view of government. But back on this issue of the legislature, sending a legislative delegation down there is almost not effective. Going around and visiting people in their office just doesn't get it. Your, your uh, lobbyist will do a good job. We need to get Anchorage legislators and work with them between sessions, get a champion for our particular issue, and have them carry it forward. Chuck Kopp has really worked to deal on the deal with the railroad, you know, mm -hmm. and got it worked out. But that's the time to get it going, is between sessions, we work with those guys, get a group of them together with legislation as good as we can get and get them to do it. And then the lobbyist keeps us informed of when that bill is being heard in a committee. And we can uh, Skype in or talk to them or make a special trip. But when it's before the committee, just going around hat in hand and meeting with legislators, and often it's not them, it's their staff, almost accomplishes nothing. <clears throat> you know, so that's what it takes to get the state to do it, is get a champion, and put together a good package for the session. And can I add? Yeah, we can go back around. Discussion that is, if we're talking about creating a legislative program and working a legislative piece, that we, what I don't see here, and I know it happens in every single committee, but the relationship is attenuated because they're on the other side of the chair. Is uh, someone? Yeah, yeah, the other side of the table. It, it would be having someone from the administration in those discussions who is able to be the liaison between the administration and the assembly as legislative priorities are established and driven because at this point and hopefully well for the next two years at least one we have strong alignment we need to work and hold that alignment and not kind of go this way and that and so but that's different than having someone sitting across the table getting you know take this question back it's more of a working relationship in that legislative process yeah and I think it's hard for the administration to know what to do with this when we don't know what we want to do yet. You know, so it's it's physician heal thyself or whatever. It's not anti them. It's sort of just getting our house in order, order and then coming and saying, we want to work with you and here's what we're interested in. And, and I think it'll line up very well, but at least we'll know. So I actually think the, the legislative program we put together this past fall was a good program. And I think the things we had in there made sense, were, were good, and we worked with the administration to do that. And I think basically Suzanne, Fleet Green, and Ona Browse were kind of our, our ongoing relationship. Um, but what we haven't done, and what I think we need to do, is exactly what Fred was talking about, which is keep pursuing that, you know? Pursue it in the, the there's not really an off-season in the legislature anymore, right? Or there's much less than there used to be. And to keep working that, and to, um, and to do that, that follow through, absolutely with the administration. But I actually think that the program we put together last year was good. I just wanted to see us actually follow up on mm -hmm. it and continue with it. And I actually don't think for the next two years we're going to see, unless there's some massive exogenous shock, I think our, our legislative program is going to stay pretty consistent. It was like, give us more local control over property taxes, um, fix our port, or help us fix our port, and there's a couple other things in there, you know. But the, the broad policy thrusts are, are kind of going to, I think, remain constant next year. There's well, they need to understand that the right. port is not an Anchorage port. It's the port of Alaska. Yeah, that's right. Because mm -hmm. this is a regional port. It's not just Anchorage that hurts if this port dies. It's the whole state. And they need to understand that in their bones. I don't really think they do. No, they don't want to either. Yeah. That's an Anchorage thing. Why worry about it? Why so, worry about it? It's strange to me that I don't feel like the Anchorage legislators have been our allies to the degree I would expect. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, you think there'd be an Anchorage delegation. It doesn't seem to be actually working that way. And I don't know if that's irreconcilable because of ideology, um, but maybe that's something that we can try to work on. Like, 
Anchorage itself should have a voice. Mm -hmm. What's your sense on that? I'll come to you, on, on Anchorage operating in the legislative as Anchorage? Yeah, so I'm not stupid, but I'm really slow. <laughs> and it takes me quite a while to figure things out. After I'd been in the legislature for a while, I thought, you need these guys ever play team sports? <laughs> <laughs> they all act like shooting guards, you know, throw me the ball, where's the camera? You know, instead of making the team and the mission happen. And I don't mean to sound all that noble, but, in, and to some degree, you'll, you'll run into that here too, you know. Yeah, yeah, I care about the city, but, you know, and so on. And, and it takes some effort to build that team spirit, you know, and the sense of the mission. I appreciate Dick. I mean, he's probably not going to be president, maybe not even governor, and is not driven probably by future... Uh, I'm not worried about future aspirations. Yeah, nor am I for very obvious reasons, but... <laughs> But <laughs> Churchill said famously, the most delicate climate in the world isn't in the Mediterranean or the Caribbean, it's to live in the good graces of the poles. Mm -hmm. And who can predict how that's going to fall out? He says the wise statement ultimately, statesman ultimately ends up doing the right thing, hoping he lives long enough <laughs> you know, to prove it. And, and we're going to face statesman-like decisions. The state and for us, we're not only not going to make everybody happy, we're going to make some people really unhappy and so on in order to get the job done that we need before us. But we've got some people out there and we need to reach out and bring them into the team and be human enough to say, we've got to kind of look out for them too. I mean, I sat here and we had a really tough decision and we had to get six votes and we went in the back room and a couple of guys said, what we're trying to do is right. I can't vote for it. They'll be hunting me with dogs and flashlights by midnight. <laughs> you know, can we get enough votes here without me so I can duck? You know, and once in a while, we've got to look out for each other and including our Anchorage legislature. And give them some cover, you know, and if they're really in a tough spot, <laughs> you know, and so, but I think it's absolutely worth doing. They've got to feel like they're a part of our team, work with us in the things we agree on, fight like dogs and cats on you know, the other ones, hopefully with some consideration. But getting them to act with us as a team, absolutely, has got to be done. And, and I think this is the summer to do that because it's not an election year, so they are going to have a little more time to pay attention. So if we're going to get... Uh, try to get lined up with people that are in the right committees, this would be the summer to do that. I agree. Excellent. Yeah, and, and you know, um, something Forrest said sort of popped something into my mind. So, you know, the uh, assembly uh, and the school board, uh, they meet together once quarter. every quarter or so. Quarter. Um, and, you know, they talk about how we can work as a team and, and do things together, right? Has there ever been a joint meeting between the assembly and the Anchorage delegation to the legislature? It's rare, and no, not the answer is no to your question. There's so many of us. We've there, got to figure out the logistics. I mean, that's the like the no. beginning is just talking mm. to them as a group. Right? I mean, we've been here with them when they have the caucus meets right. here. Yeah, and we're right, here, right. But we're just and among. When the many caucus, other people to talk to them. Yeah, and when the caucus meets here, I think someone, I think the chair and the vice chair, give a presentation. We talk. But that's the that. limit of, so you know. What I'm seeing you're talking about is like half these chairs, assembly, half these chairs, members of the legislature in right. a formalized discussion where it's noticed in both places and there's a discussion. That's an interesting concept. We do, I, we, when we have a legislative program, we have a meeting, we have a lunch over there at the King Career Center and invite the legislators there. We talked to them about our legislative program. And you're right, pretty much that's the last time we talked to legislators about our legislative program. And they don't come. So that needs real failure. rethinking on how we do that. Cause, it's a Because both with the school board and what we do, either they don't come to that. And we we kind of come to the caucus, but like you said, we're just ordinary. It's, it's not any dialogue. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. And, you know, I mean, the reputation that people in the legislature, I mean, what they expect from all the, these groups out there is send more money. You know, and, and talking about conceptual things and 
help us be able to take care of our business, mm -hmm. hardly ever comes up. I mean, it's, and it's because and there's no time. And we need to well, yeah, yeah, and we need to put, to, put together the, yeah. the time to do it. So I'm a mariner, and uh, a mariner knows you want to catch a weather window, and if you can't catch the tide going your way. Pilots want the same sorts of thing. Some wise person says, never, never miss the opportunities that come with a crisis. We've got a crisis that can't be avoided. And the financial thing and so on. How do we take advantage of this wave? That wave can really add impetus to what you're talking about. Give us some authority to do things with management and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. We're unique among all the cities in Alaska because of our size. We have about 60% of the state's population. Our assembly districts are twice the size of Senate districts. And sometimes the people down in Juneau forget that, how large our assembly districts are. Most towns aren't structured the way we are. They're smaller towns. We're not a small entity. If we were to meet with the uh, anchor legislators, I would, I would sort of, I would actually avoid having us mm -hmm. up here and be yeah. formalized. Yeah. I would like to do something more like this. But even this would be difficult because there's so many of them. So we'd have to figure out a way to break out groups or what have you. Um, but I, I, I do like the idea of us of us meeting with them a little bit. Now, what I don't want us to do, and you know, I grew up in Cordova, I grew up in rural Alaska. I don't want us to set up where it's urban against rural and, and Anchorage is fighting the rest of the state. Um, but I do think that the city of Anchorage uh, is, um, and the municipality of Anchorage, uh, doesn't speak with one voice on some things that don't hurt the rest of the state, but that we need to do and we need to have. And I think the municipal tax authority is one of the ones that I think is, falls into that category. Is anybody I missed wanting in? You've been in too much. You can wait. Um, <laughs> all right, back to you. <clears throat> yeah, so back to your earlier things. I, I would encourage just at least experiment with the people in this body who are interested in a particular issue, freedom to do the economic development stuff and so on, uh, meet with the legislators who are on the appropriate committees or have an interest in that very thing and notice it. You know, so they can sit down at a restaurant or, you know, wherever it is and, and say, look, we got to work this through. And, you know, meet the open meetings kind of thing give you a chance to work with the key, key people in a small group. You know, so and we can do three, right? Three assembly members is legal. When you we get can four, do three, you can't do four. Yeah, so you could... Four you, you have to notice. Three assembly meters could meet with an infinite number of, of legislators and do whatever they want. So I like Eric started this meeting, he talked about the Open Meetings Act. We live it literally here on the assemblies. For example, we had one assembly... We. When Begich went down to where Begich went, we had Matt take over. Matt started calling every assembly member asking for their support. And that violated the Open Meetings Act. You can only talk to three assembly members before you have a real problem. So just keep in mind, we do actually live the Open Meetings. We have to. So sure. What I've liked about this, and no offense to our, our, our friend here who is, is taking notes on what we're saying, but um, I like us being open, but not necessarily inclusive, if that makes sense. That is, uh, it's good to hear from the public and public comment. It's good to hear from the work sessions if we ask them to or, or, or hearings. But there needs to be a time when we're just talking to each other. And it's okay to have it heard by everyone else. And if there's an opportunity, maybe they can comment or what have you. But we need to, to have this kind of, of long-form discussion with each other sometimes. right? And it doesn't have to be every month, but I do like to have these kind of topics. Yeah, and it's really, an, uh, it's, real quick, it's really unusual. I mean, LV, uh, uh, and to her great credit, LV said, I, uh, I'm the chair and I want to call a meeting. And I said, I'm not asking you to call a meeting. You have the right to, as chair to do or not do. But I can't meet with over three, or three right? I can't three. meet with this group unless you put it on the notice board. So LV, please put it on the notice board, even though you, you know you have a different opinion. And, and I said, to her great credit, she said, great, I disagree that this is the right time, but I'll let you do it, and and so we can we so we can have this. And yeah, we, we can tell the public look this. There's time for public comment. This ain't it. This is you're welcome to listen in on us, and we respect the, the your right to do that. 
But this isn't common or anything. This is us talking about us. And I want to just respond to that a little bit. Um, coming most recently from being one of those noisy activists in the street <laughs> who shows up at meetings and begs for time, um, I find it to be one of the most frustrating aspects of this body that I would suggest that 99% of what the work is done at this body isn't open and available to the public to comment and be a participant in. And I know that um, town halls and public meetings are rarely effective because one person shows up and uh, people are busy, et cetera. But, and I'm not saying I see any change that we could do or make, I don't know. But I can tell you there's a pretty strong frustration among the, the members of the public, myself included, when you come forward and there's important matters being discussed and there isn't a vehicle for you to have input, mm -hmm. especially people who are long dedicated and you're told to wait until 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. You're told maybe if we have a few minutes at the end and yet all of your neighborhood issues are being slammed down your throat and you're the voice, but you don't have a voice. And so I just, I am very sensitive to that notion. Now that you have an official email account, or do you have a one yet? Not yet. I, I think you'll realize how impactful that is in our discussions. Yeah, and so like that's, we actually do read those emails and they have, I've seen ordinances swayed by two or three emails. It's crazy. And, but the meat is, the sausage is made at the work sessions. Decisions are effectively organized and it doesn't happen until you get here, but people generally at a work session come to the conclusion, this is what I'm probably gonna do. And it's rare that three minutes at this microphone changes testimony, changes the vote. And uh, I just wanna say that I am pretty sensitive to that. And I'm not rebuking you or any of the process here. I don't know any better answer. This body's been organized over generations and it, it does a pretty good job. But that's- Let's make it do better. Dick, did you want to? Just for our new members, we have orientation coming up this next week. Is structured orientation. Mm -hmm. So please come to it. You know, if we have a problem, like in your case, we'll bring it to you if we have to. Because this, we're going to have the departments come and tell you what they do, how they interface with you. So please come to orientation. Don't miss it. We've had some of some members that have missed it for whatever reason, and they lose something in the perspective. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk to you about things like ID cards. And it's relative, relative because nobody could get in this room. But I have to do is flash my ID card out there, and the door opens for me. We need to make sure we get this done for you guys. You didn't know that, John? I, I did it work on this door. No, it doesn't work on that no. door. That door's got to be fixed, but it did work on the other door. Yeah. John? Sorry. Maybe it's off topic a little bit, but just to address uh, Chris's comment, because I kind of come from the same background. Chris does this kind of like a citizen activist thing, but I, uh, the three minutes is absolutely not effective. The email is not particularly effective. The one-on-one -on -one with the assembly members isn't effective. The doing big things out front with the stickers isn't. But you combine it all, and right. it is. And then I rare response I have to any constituent is, your community council is this one. It meets at this time. Yeah. You should be bringing Absolutely. it up from there to be really effective in your community. The three minutes is of some value, but it's late in the game. You can start early. People need to know that. And I, I have boilerplate stuff I put on almost every email saying this is your deal. And so it is. But to pretend that three minutes, it, it's not supposed to be right. at that point. It's in addition to the month prior. Yeah, I, you know that everyone should. You John, know that, but, you said that coming here testify is not effective. Well, I should say if it's If you not jam right. the assembly chambers, I'm talking about jam it for two days mm -hmm. of hearings, as we do Hill 37, <laughs> it's very effective. Yeah. Yeah. But in the taxes. broader things, it, it thinks breadth of things. The court will do that. Uh, so we have about half an hour left. I'd like to get everyone out by noon. Um, any more on general visioning goals? Yeah. Um, this is, uh, again, we will be, we've been approached on some broader policy issues for state stuff and national. And, um, that really isn't our playground or sandbox or whatever. So we'll have people talk. We should declare ourselves a sanctuary city. Uh, it's a broad mm -hmm. thing. We should declare ourselves anti-Trump. We should, um, you know, the whole, I mean, all these bigger things. And, and to me, I, my sense is, I just want to focus on stuff that we can have an impact mm -hmm. on. I want to deal with that. I don't want to learn about it. I'm too busy doing this. And, I mean, what the sense is there, because I think all that tends to do is just inflame people, distract mm -hmm. us from what we're doing. Not that it's not important, but we'll have, like, the move to amend people have been hit every community council, and they'll come here and say, we want assemblies of support to amend the Constitution for corporations, not for people, and so on. And going, okay, I may agree or not, but that's not us. But an assembly you. member could bring a resolution forward. Could, for could. example, I don't know, opposing the Patriot Act. I had a assembly member down here that did it. 
And did it fire this place up? Absolutely. Right. And so is the assembly member. If you got something you feel passionately about, write a resolution and bring it to the assembly, and we'll debate it. We're opposing yep. marijuana. I yeah, but your point, point is, is we ought to stay in. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, that's every assembly member's rights, what I'm I trying to say. I understand that, but so, I'm just letting it out there. Mm -hmm. I may support it, but I may vote no because it's just not our. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can always walk out of the room, too, because that's no vote. Hmm? You walk out of the room, it's no vote. Yeah, well, yeah. The single member district is um, particularly challenging. A fine in institution. In the, con yeah. in the context of just simply moving and second an item onto the agenda. You know, it's an actual limitation upon a major population of this town. And I don't have a solution. I'm not going to go charging for it at this time. To, I have people that have c come to me and said we should sue. And well, do you think it should be rotated as it was? Probably? I don't know the answer to that. It might be the single member districts are better, but that's a fundamental change. And I don't want to necessarily go there, but I want folks to be sensitive about the fact that the single member district is disenfranchised and needs support to get items on the agenda and move forward. I, I think you'll find that getting a second, almost a courtesy second, is easier than you think, but you let me know. And do do let us know, as the only single member district, whether you want to say, because if you don't want it, your district doesn't want it to be moved around, then it shouldn't be. But if you do, then we've got to, we've got to confront that. Everybody says do it. I'm just not necessarily willing to dive into that train wreck. Okay, so Morris, I, and then I, I, I agree that it should be rotated, actually. But um, the, the two things for, for this discussion here, I think, the, the structural things is, um, one, we have to be mindful. So we've been talking about increasing the, the jurisdiction of the legislative uh, committee. Uh, we've talked about maybe increasing transportation and you know, doing all these other things. But we have to keep in mind that time is a very precious resource for us. You know, this is a we're supposed to be part time. We're not actually right. Um, but none of us, you know, uh, for those of us that are working, like, like most of us, I think, are still working. Um, I'm not. I, I know, but most of us are, and it's it's just difficult. We can't stack. We can't keep stacking many many things uh, onto this, and that's kind of goes to what John was saying. That we have to sort of stay in our lane to a certain degree, and that's both to maintain that precious resource of time, but also because, you know, of the institutions that I've been a part of, and I haven't been a part of them as long as, as, as Fred or as Eric or Pete or anyone, um, when it comes to Juno or Washington, D.C., but I've worked in both places. This has been the most collegial atmosphere I've seen, and I, I'm, wor you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can maintain what we had the last year. So we had some passionate disagreements last year about a variety of issues, but we were able to maintain a degree of civility and a degree of, of you know, mutual working together that I haven't seen elsewhere. And I just hope that we can continue that into the next year or two. Absolutely, yeah, I totally agree with that. So three, if, if, if we'll, we'll come back okay. and um, I think, um, well, likely that we'll have more of these. It, mm -hmm. it, it was so new to the body that sort of there was that resistance, but I think we'll try and find ways to do this kind of thing. And, and maybe with even more concrete results. Three specific things that, that so going back up on the agenda, um, work session scheduling. So talking to Baggage, talking to Craig Campbell, uh, Ernie's son, but I was trying to talk to a lot of former uh, chairs. Uh, there have been various times done various ways. Dick's been through it a lot, but Friday used to be always work sessions. And at least in the last year, more Wednesday and Thursday. And committees can set up their own time. You've got a regular time to do, and people can get used to that, and you can work with your committee members. But in terms of where the assembly is all, all meeting together. It's right. Well, yeah. right. And I, um, for my scheduling, um, getting hiring somebody to get help on the logs, but when I can block off Friday and know that, Wednesday and Thursday things aren't going to pop up, and I can block off the committee's time that, that I know that I'm on. That, that helps a lot. And I've had various members say that would help a lot if we knew that it was a regular Friday afternoon deal. Yeah. Here's the reason why. When I first came on the assembly, you were here. You remember we'd start work sessions on Tuesdays, usually at 9 o'clock. And then we'd go till 4 o'clock, come here at 5 o'clock, and go till 10 or 11 at night. That was stupid. <laughs> so we changed it to just having work sessions on Fridays, major work session. Committees can meet when they meet, but the work sessions primarily are designed for Fridays. So you've got the weekend to adjust the information before your Tuesday assembly meeting. 
But those have blended into Wednesday and Thursday crazy. work sessions. And I Only ones are, some committees are Wednesday and Thursday, but it's not the summing meetings. We've kept them just to Fridays. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was going to say something with a smart heart guy. <laughs> Man, I'm trying to repent of that. <laughs> okay, good. Um, <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Ah. <laughs> He's not repentant. Yeah. <laughs> I think Fridays in Alaska are dumb. Mm. You know, and most of you are, or many of you are used to working five, uh, five eights, and so on and so forth. And a lot of us that long weekends and so on, uh, hunting, all those kind of things, and Friday messes it up. Put it in the middle of the week, you know, and give people their weekends. Uh, particularly during hunting and fishing season, you know, and so on and so forth. So that's my vote. I like it. So a regular time, though, having work sessions where people can rely that when we schedule them, when we need them, they're going to be Thursday afternoon, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Well, you know, I, the, the reason Friday, besides that, it's a challenge, is we get our binders mm -hmm. Thursday, and I want to blitz them and read them and send in my questions, which now have slipped to Monday or Tuesday morning, which is not fair to, we don't get the information on time, it's not fair to the staff. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, if we get it on Thursday and we have meetings all day <coughs> Friday, what are you going to do? So I, I mean, I'd be more inclined to say, you know, work sessions on things coming, particularly coming up with the next meeting would be either Wednesday or <coughs> Thursday to get our binder and we got in front of us at the work session on it. And then if I got follow up, I could, Right, I'm Fred, also with changes when you were on the body, the pack would be delivered to us. Now we have to pick it up. We quit doing that years ago because of cost. Mm -hmm. So now you have to pick up your pack. We don't doesn't get delivered to your house anymore. You know, I've I've challenged the clerk's office to try to get us the binder earlier. Mm -hmm. And there's some kind of they described it as very difficult or almost impossible. Even one day would make a big difference for exactly what you're talking about, the chance to read it and formulate questions and get it to staff, not on a Monday. Um, if we could get the packet on Wednesday and then have our work sessions either that Wednesday or Thursday, I think that would be preferable. But we have to talk to the clerk's office about why it seems so difficult to get it. Uh, Julia, you? Can, can you weigh in on why it takes well, I. My experience is that until um, the last couple of years, the day that binders were ready was Wednesday. So in the uh, 11 and a half years that I've been here, it's only within the last couple of years that that has slipped past Wednesday. Because I can remember, uh, you know, the years checking in with uh, Heidi about something else and having Heidi say, my day is Wednesday, can we go get it on Wednesday? And so I don't... So it, is but that again, maybe a lack of staffing, lack of staffing, right. lack of staffing in the clerk's office? Is, is that slowing that down maybe? I don't know. I think that a couple of things uh, had to schedule wise. So, so the way that the system is set up more or less now is that there will be work sessions scheduled for Friday afternoon of the Friday before an assembly meeting. So if you don't have an assembly meeting, uh, the upcoming Tuesday, then generally there haven't been uh, Friday work sessions because the idea is to have the work session in anticipation of the next assembly meeting. So that's one way. Then there's the scheduling, and they will uh, go over this in the uh, training that you have, but the clerk's office, um, in order to have items available for publication on the agenda, they need to be sent in to the clerk's office by noon on the Friday, 11 days before the assembly meeting, whatever that other Friday is, or however many days it is, and it's 12 days. And so that's your agenda deadline. So things go, go you don't need to be stacked right. in there. Go ahead. Well, yeah, so got that. We'll check that out. But there's those restrictions. I have Dick and then Chris and the friend. Just, it's available Sundays on Wednesdays. Again, you have to pick it up. And we may do a better job letting you know it's available, on what day it's available. But we do not deliver it to your house as we did before. It's not available to pick up on Wednesdays. It's you might check with Heidi. I think it's either Wednesday or Thursday. It's, it's rarely Wednesday. It's, it's usually Thursday, pretty late in the afternoon. And I know because I go 
every Wednesday and Thursday. Like, hey, is it ready? Yet? Chris, well, you go through new well, member orientation. Bring it up. To also, me. yeah, I think that the, the clerk works for the assembly, and if the assembly says have it ready by Wednesday, the clerk will make the adjustments necessary. It but will. I think beware of moving meetings to Thursday. I don't know how many of you have community councils on Thursday night, but I, every Thursday night, so that sets up another Wednesday night. eight in the morning until night. eleven at night or ten at night, and so. Yeah. That makes for really hard, and if you're liaising with the public, that you need to be as fresh as you can. It's usually on the afternoons, but it's a good point, Fred. We're in charge of our business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Push it all out a week. <clears throat> you know, so we always have the packet nine days in advance, <clears throat> or whatever, and there's a mechanism for an exception. Well, well, at various times, both Dick and Fred said, we set the policy, then we don't always do a good job of, of doing and the, and the mayor's supposed to implement it. It's often the other way around. He sets the policy, and we're kind of playing catch-up. And That's our own fault. Well, that's right, and so we need to do a better job of it, and we set our own procedures, and the reason for this meeting. We can reset them, figure out how to do it better, however we want. Um, almost out of time, the third thing that was here, I listed the liaisons. It's not a huge point. Um, people can... Uh, say which entities they're interested in being the representative for. Really, I guess what I want to ask here is, is there something left off that list? There's, there's, there's somebody, some important entities that we haven't reached out to and said, would you like a specific assembly member that is a representative? For I think you? Visit Anchorage has got, usually has something. Yeah, I put ACVB yeah, in. Oh, uh, yeah. But, yeah. Anyway, not now, but you can think about it. Um, and wh which particular entities you'd like to liaison with? Um, closing questions on anything? Well, question on that. I mean, I know we have official liaisons, but uh, do you really need those? I mean, I, I'm on a force as a liaison to Chamber of Commerce, but I'm on a Chamber Committee and have been for 10 years, and I still go. And it's like, you I think know. It's, we, I, 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 I like them. I mean, I, some of them I. I I, probably, I met with the president of UAA once. I'm the UAA APU person. I helped set up that internship, which I thought, you know, build up that relationship. But I think it's good to, to have those, um, both because people might take them and run with them, but also because um, I think there's symbolic value to it. You know, even if you're not actively working it, it's certainly preferable to be, but I think there's symbolic value to have them. Dick? We've gotten rid of some liaisons in the past, and we can get rid of them again, and we can add them in. It's strictly something we do. We used to have a fish agriculture liaison down in Keene, I remember. Yeah. And I used to drive down Me there too. to Friday right. for those meetings and back up there again. We dropped that because there was no relevant importance in it. But we do, can we can add committees in if we need them, liaisons. Isn't much of that based on your interest? Because it's your time commitment. I think that sure. if you're willing and interested, then there's an opportunity if they want you. It's a relationship that is good. You can always show up to them. The assembly like right. We That's said before, it used to be part time. We stopped it being part time at around fifty to sixty thousand people. It's not part time. This is a full time commitment. Just how it is. Now hold on, I, I talked Suzanne into this by telling yeah, you. Yeah, Suzanne. He lied to you, okay? <laughs> I think if we operate effectively and transparently, we can do other things and still do this job. I think. Anybody want to say anything that wasn't covered or reiterate? No, I just wanted to um, mention you had um, talked about the opiate um, epidemic, and that's very important to me as well to address. And I share your view that in terms of it being related to crime and some of these other issues, it's huge. And that was something that came up when I went door to door mm -hmm. and some of the stories I have heard um, you know, the youth in our district and everything are very, very concerning. So I didn't mention that at the time because it was. I want to add back to that. But it was one of my greatest frustrations to watch the ad hoc committee on alcohol and drug use become the homelessness committee mm -hmm. because it steered what I saw as a very important broader mission to tackle kind of those key several elements that are creating this community tension and this problem into one. And the mayor's mm -hmm. team has done a great job, but I think that that's, that's something to reconsider down the road is, you know, where does that go? Because that is an area of focus the city really needs to have direct attention on. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's right. And when, you know, uh, yeah, in my area where 
a bunch of stuff stolen in the garage by an opiate addict, white opiate addict, and now they're mad at the homeless. You know, mm -hmm. it's sort of, we've almost done this publicly, this shift from what was a different problem to your blaming them on the thing. Forced and addicted. Uh, so I was saying on that, um, and I don't think this is what you were hinting at, but I would resist like reconstituting with alcohol and drug a new committee for what I talked about before about the constraints on our time. But I do think refocusing the public safety committee in that way, you know, the homeless issue, we're working it in the homelessness committee, and the uh, public safety committee all often talks about it. But, but, um, and then and then there's the the murders and the very high profile crimes. Uh, those are largely exogenous. There's relatively little we can do to stop a. To, if I use that twice, yeah, <laughs> sorry. I'm gonna but, go look it up afterwards. Well, they, they are outside of our control for oh, a yeah. degree. They 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 you know a, a domestic violence murder. There's relatively little we can do, unfortunately, on the on the assembly. Um, mm -hmm. But if we were to try to focus the public safety committee a little bit more on opiates or on addiction, I think that would be fruitful. Dick. We can refocus public safety on opiates because mm -hmm. it is part of it. But relative to homelessness, everybody wants to blame somebody else for crime. I spent time in Spain. Spaniards commit no crime, it's the gypsies that do it. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you want to blame somebody else for your problem. Here, it's the homelessness that do it all, and it's not the homelessness, mm -hmm. it's Felix. our friends and neighbors yeah. doing it. And so this brings me back to the first point I made uh, oh, during this very meeting, right? Well done. I like that. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, uh, committees, if they want to set up work plans and goals, and if public mm -hmm. safety wants to make one of their goals on how to tackle the opiate uh, addiction issue, then let that be part of their goal and set up um, actual, you know, structured, how mm -hmm. do we want to tackle this? We can actually direct them to do that. Right. Yeah, so when Dick said, we say, we expect you to, and we expect that the assembly is going to say, now we understand what the public safety committee is going to do, what transfer it, and in very general terms, and, and we're going to mm -hmm. watch you do it. Mm -hmm. So that's a tactic then of implementing a strategic plan is you can set the focus of a committee. Absolutely. Fine. Okay, so that's... Love you guys. And then you Thank have you. to also agree to be on the committee. Anything else? <laughs> and do the work. For the good Actually, agree, actually mm -hmm. do the work. Good. Okay, the posted. We are adjourned. Excuse me. Excuse me. You might, since you're modeling uh, the public right. uh, process, you might go ahead and add what the clerk has, and other times, put on the agendas at the request of the chair, vice chairs, to offer uh, anybody in the public sure. their time. Eugene, to, it's your time. We uh, uh, participate. Record it. Say who's here. Eugene. We didn't do that, David. Do you have anything you want to say to us for a minute? <laughs> you're in spin tape. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll be very brief. Uh, I think you all want to get a brief. The weekend. My name is Eugene Coffey, and I live in Memphis in the Valley. I follow the public process. The public process is done correctly. The decision made by the governing body or by the public interest. Just a couple of words on this, because I'm not going to go along with it. Is that uh, for the, some of you know who I am for years. And uh, I deal with issues when I say public process. The Open Meetings Act is with notification. But there's a separate state law that's not the Open Meetings Act that says that all public meetings you provide a reasonable opportunity for the public to be heard. Remember that part too. And, uh, and uh, for those who may not, who may think that I'm not around, I'm closely watching what the Anchor Assembly is doing over the time I'm not in here. But I am at the Bureau of Seven Meetings at the back. Um, I uh, monitor the Epoch, the last of the Public Offices Commission. I monitor uh, Kabbalah, that's the uh, one that uh, this has been one means, at least temporarily, but how they comply. Um, there's probably no one in the state that is more aware of how meetings are not in compliance. The Open Meetings Act, the reasonable opportunity for public to be heard. And I would also like this line that I haven't said to the your community, but I've said it out in the Valley and elsewhere is the more complicated an issue is, the more notice, the more opportunity for the public to be heard. Thank you very much. You found out about this from the website? Um, respond to the question. Um, regards to your notice, I, I'm I see it on the website. It is noted there. There was no agenda for the meeting, and the meeting is going to be at 10 o'clock, but the doors were locked. 
and uh, we had to wait for the car to open up the door. Uh, one member of the family was nearby me, and we went around the area uh, and uh, found the doors not open. And uh, this is obviously a, not a good thing. And um, as far as your agenda, um, having agendas hand out at any meeting is not the time to do this. It should be out there on the website and it should be clearly identified. And I'm looking at this one. It just has a word agenda. It doesn't say this party language. It doesn't say what, what and it is. It doesn't have a date or anything like that. And it, this could be interpreted for anything. And you don't know where it was, what time, whatever. So with all respect is obviously the best comment is that when you set up these meetings, you need to make it an opportunity for the public to be here and to speak. And they have to have a clear idea way in advance of what's going on so they can say, okay, um, I'm interested, let me, let's, let's attend. Also, think about also the media. Um, with respect to them, if they get this kind of scenario, and I've seen it, is how do they get the most out to the community about these meetings? Is there a loop? And um, I do watch when things are posted and very carefully, and I see sometimes like a couple of days out for some of these meetings, and uh, just a full little final note is, I've been carefully observing your election. That's what I've been doing over the years, and I was present at the meetings that were, what was it, today's Saturday, right? Uh, Thursday. Uh, I was the lone observer for the afternoon portion, and then came to the meeting that started at 5 30. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good. Uh, on that, I have a quick question about just for you, Dick, actually. Well, can we? It's, but I just realized on the thing, would everyone just say who's here? So just say Good your name. Guys. Christopher Constant. Forrest Dunbar. Dick Ray. Suzanne LaFrance. Felix Rivera. John Waddleton. Pete Peterson. Eric Croft. Eugene Carl Haberman. Julia Tucker. <coughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there's, um, the state of Alaska provides a service that's a public notice the email service. Do we have that here? Can I put my email in somewhere and just get every notice that the city puts out? Because if not, we really ought to put Can you speed. check with the clerk's office to find that out? Because yeah. they handle that. Because I don't think there is. I know that there's a website for sending mail. Do you hit that and just go to everybody sending mail? Right. right. I would like to see us. I would ask Barbara. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for being here.